Welcome to Future Squared, the podcast all about corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-empowerment. Future Squared brings you a double dose of innovation inspiration every week to help you and your company stay relevant in an era of rapid change and 10x your results in both your professional and personal life. Each week, I'll bring you corporate innovators, entrepreneurs, authors, keynote speakers, and thought leaders such as Steve Blank, David Allen, Brad Feld, Tim Harford, Karen Dillon, Jenny Blake, Neil Patel, Rand Fishkin, Pascal Finette, Ryan Blair, and Ash Moria, to name just a few. While every Friday, I'll bring you Fast Fix Friday, some quick digestible insights to help you end your week on a high as you head off for the weekend. Future Squared is brought to you by Collective Campus, an innovation hub school and consultancy based in Melbourne, Australia and Singapore that works with companies to help them adopt the mindset, methods and tools to navigate change and survive and thrive in an era of rapid disruption. If your organization needs help coming up with ideas, testing and turning ideas into reality, incubating teams, driving cultural change or connecting and partnering with startups, then visit www.collectivecamp.us. And without further ado, here's today's podcast. Welcome back to Future Square. Today, I bring you not one, but two guests. First up, Joel Gershman. He's a leading coach, author, and educator in the field of business growth management and leadership. Drawing on more than 15 years of battle-tested experience running multiple fast-growing technology startups and learning under some of the world's leading business gurus, including Michael Gerber, author of The E-Myth Revisited, Joel has helped thousands of business leaders to achieve more stability, more financial freedom, and more time for life. Joel also brings a unique perspective to managing the people side of business growth. With his background as a commercial lawyer and years of experience as mediator and university lecturer in negotiation, conflict resolution, and influential communication, Joel is an expert in the psychology of influencing human behavior. Joel is the founder and CEO of a leading business coaching company called The Change Coach, as well as co-creator of the Mindful Entrepreneur's Growth System, a proven step-by-step system designed to grow your revenue, your free time, and your sense of fulfillment. Howard Finger is the CEO of VinciWorks. Founded in 2004, VinciWorks is the world's leading provider of online compliance and risk management solutions for the legal and financial markets. The company is on a mission to create a safer, fairer, and more honest world by facilitating competitive businesses to collaboratively develop better, non-competitive solutions. The Mindful Entrepreneur chronicles the story of how Howard The entrepreneur, Joel, the business coach, and Arya, the rabbi, work together to not only turn around VinciWorks, but turn around Howard's life in the process. So with that, it gives me much pleasure to bring you two of the main characters of this book, and also co-authors of The Mindful Entrepreneur, Joel Gershman and Howard Finger. Welcome to the show, gentlemen. Thank you. Thanks very much. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure to have you both on the program after having read your book last week, and you're both in Melbourne, I understand. Uh, at the moment, we're both in Melbourne. Yep. Um, sometimes Howard is in different parts of the world, but yes, yeah. most of the time in different parts of the world. Yeah, yeah. And, and Howard, you are normally find yourself over in London. Is that the Howard HQ at the moment? Yeah, I don't really have. My HQ is probably the um, a 747 or an A380, <laughs> um, so I'm all over, but... Uh, I'll be in London beginning of June, then the States for three or four weeks, and yeah. then Israel, and then Hong Kong, then back here, Fantastic. and then carry on round. Well, the more things change, the more they stay the same, it seems, with yourself uh, uh, consuming a lot of that uh, recycled air up in the sky. Exactly. <laughs> well, uh, I guess first up, you know, congratulations are definitely in order. Uh, your first book, The Mindful Entrepreneur, How to Rapidly Grow Your Business While Staying Sane, Focused and Fulfilled, was released a little over two weeks ago. And it's currently number one on Amazon in the categories, I believe it's office management, knowledge capital, and a few other categories. And I was literally in Dimix today on Collins Street in Melbourne, and it is being pushed hard in the business section. So congratulations on the release of the book, guys. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. That's good to hear. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, I mean, the book, I found it a fascinating read. And I guess because it, like like most true stories, uh, because it tells a true story of your entrepreneurial journey, Howard, and provides readers with a raw, you know, brutally honest tale of the highs and lows facing every entrepreneur, myself included, you know, from financial woes, social, physical, emotional struggles. And I literally read it in one evening um, from cover to cover. And I guess it's just that storytelling nature of the, bu- of the book 
you know, you've got lots of practical takeaways, tools, um, and it's just a great informative read. So, Joel, for our audience, perhaps tell us the story of how you came to start working with Howard on his business. Ah, um, that's yeah, the first couple of chapters of the book. Mm. Um, I was actually looking for some office space um, for my coaching practice, and I understood, I heard that Howard had some spare space. And I, I literally knocked on his door and I said, um, you got some space there? And he said, sure. Mm-hmm. And we ended up deciding on a bit of a you know, quid pro quo where I would coach him in exchange for being able to use his office space. Yeah, oh, fantastic. And, and, and I guess um, the, there was the office space and there was also you reaching out to Howard, I believe, to get some insight on online training and e-learning and i guess that took a back seat when you um when howard filled you in on the state of his business that's right look i'd been intending to leverage my own coaching business online and i heard howard was a bit of a, a guru in the online learning space so i'd intended to talk to him about that and we briefly discussed it but i ended up focusing on his business because he was in a, a very very difficult state i mean maybe howard can describe it um, in more vivid detail, but he was facing nothing short of a cash flow crisis. Yeah, yeah cash being the just one of the issues. I think Steve, the uh, the interesting thing was that Joel turned up looking for an office and then said to me, "Oh, you know, there's something else I want." And I remember my my stomach falling and thinking, "Oh God, he's not going to ask for a loan, is he?" <laughs> um, and um, he didn't. He just said that he wanted to look at scaling his business. And I said, "Well, what do you do?" And he said, "This coaching business." And I said, "Well, I don't know what it is. I don't know how good it is." I doubt that you can scale, you know, a coaching service over the internet. Um, so I'm not sure I can help. But that's what we said. Well, I said, well, look, if you put me through your coaching, um, I'll get a sense of whether it can work or not online. Um, and in the meantime, we'll do this barter deal around the office and, and the training. I think secretly it was like one of those, which I think I talked about in the book, one of those opportunities that showed up just at the right time because um, – I thought to myself, well, anything could help right now because my business was uh, in serious, serious difficulties, to mm. say the least. Yeah, yeah. And um, on being in serious difficulties, um, I mean, at one stage you were so busy with the day-to-day of working in your business that you lost sight of the important and only focused on on what appeared to you to be urgent. And I guess that's reminiscent of what not to do from Stephen Covey's Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, one of my all-time favorite books. And it wasn't until Joel gave you some key insights um, which prompted you to tighten up the company's accounts receivable process and subsequently ease your cash flow woes a little bit. Um, And that prompted you to think, well, what else might be broken? You know, Joel's come come along with this key insight. It's it's, uh, dramatically improved one aspect of my business. And I guess how important was that initial revelation to you um, seeking that ongoing counsel? Uh, Look, Steve, I think it's, uh, I think what what we've, what the book is, is, is as you said, it, it's sort of like the, the, the typical, we've written the archetypal um, small business story mm. where none of us have the time to focus on, you know, the, 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 the bigger picture yeah. because we're constantly putting out fires. Um, and I think what it was, what I, what, the difference with Joel when he came and gave me this, said he would do the, the coaching was I thought I was going to get taken through this lengthy process. Um, and he said to me, look, Let's start where the most pain is. Where's your biggest pain right now? And I said, cash flow. He said, okay, let's focus on cash flow. Um, and instantly with focus straight into where I felt the pain was. Now, ultimately, it was obviously there's a lot more issues going on. And within literally within a week, um, I brought in, you know, it wasn't a lot of money at that time, but, but about 30, 40,000 pounds, which got paid the immediate bills, got me out of, Mm-hmm. immediate trouble and it was just as obvious that what he did was he gave me a, a system a process to follow up and collect on my inv- outstanding invoices now when I look back today it seems so how could I have been so stupid not to have had a system in place mm-hmm. but I think like most small businesses I just when I needed the money and it wasn't coming in I'd phone the clients and then when it when I didn't desperate I waited yeah and then a, a system or a process in place once I implemented that, it changed the business. And I recognized that if I can do it for this one aspect of the business, business, then surely it can apply to the rest of the business. And so, you know, I'm your typical cynical businessman. 
Um, but the you know proof is in the pudding, as they say, or in the eating. And and um, now my business has turned around, and it's it's I must say I'm very successful and very happy in that place. Mm. That's fantastic. And on, on systems, uh, Joel, um, I, I love the way you summarized uh, a strategic plan in a neat triangle covering both uh, direction and execution. And I like that it all starts with your purpose and vision at the top of that triangle, which reminds me of a quote from Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, when you have a clear vision, everything else becomes much easier. So how important yeah. is it to have that vision first and foremost? Yeah, look, I think it's, I think it's really critical. Um, you know, we've, we call that book The Mindful Entrepreneur. Mm. And when we use the word mindful, we're not using it in terms of, you know, mindfulness meditation. We're using it in terms of being deliberate and strategic mm. about what you're doing, why you're doing it, where you're going, rather than just, you know, moving from one day to the next, hoping that the next day will be better than the day before. It's about being strategic. And the, perhaps the very first thing that one needs to do in terms of being strategic is to identify where you're going. Mm -hmm. What's your vision? What are you trying to achieve? Which kind of clients are you trying to work, or customers are you are intending to work with? Yeah. What kinds of products and services? What kind of result are you aiming to achieve? If, you know, if you don't know where you're going, it's very hard to get there. Yeah, 100%. And on that core purpose, um, Howard, in the book, Joel sensed that you were putting the business first pretty much at the expense of everything else in your life. Um, you know, your emotional and mental well-being was, let's just say, not at its optimal state. And he urged you to contact a friend of his, uh, a rabbi by the name of Arya Goldman. And it wasn't until subsequently being nagged by your wife to give him a call while you're waiting to uh, hop on a plane to Hong Kong that you decided, well, what the hell, I'll give him a call. What's the worst that can happen? So, um, I mean, what prompted you to make that phone call in initially? And I guess how life-changing was it to have him, I suppose, craft your core purpose? Well, so first of all, you know, when Joel suggested it, I, I said, look, I, I'm, I don't need a shrink and mm -hmm. I don't need a, a rabbi, thanks, right? Um, it was the last thing I needed. What I needed was cash. Um, and But it was that, that moment when I'd, I'd gone through, you know, and, and you know, learn in the book, I, I travel a lot, um, and I'd gone through – Check in, and I hadn't been given the seat I normally get on the plane, mm -hmm. and I'd check in my bag, which I don't normally have to check in, and therefore I didn't have my power pack, and I couldn't plug it, and everything was like, I, and I realised I stopped for the moment, and realised just how stressed I was for this one little um, problem that had arisen. It wasn't really a significant problem, all right. Um, and at that point, that's when I spoke to Andrew because the plane was delayed, and and she said, oh, I noticed you're still you know, still online, how come you haven't left? And I said, oh, the plane's late. And she listened to me go on and on for like 10 minutes mm -hmm. about this, my, my getting the wrong seat. And she said, you know, why don't you call that guy that go, Joel gave you the name for? And I said, I'm fine. <laughs> you know, and at that point I thought, and I think that's one of the, 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 the keys is, is being willing to recognize that you don't necessarily have all the answers. Yeah. Um, and being willing to just step back a bit and listen. Um, and did it change my life? I, yeah, I us not overstate it. I mean, but he gave me, Joel, um, Aria gave me the ability to just look at things in a different way. Mm. Um, and to, to also, as you said, that, that whole point, what's the point of, of living this stressed out life if it's just about survival? Mm. And I think many small businessmen live from day to day, putting out the fires and surviving. And there's no satisfaction in that. And he, when, he, when I saw that, it wasn't as if he said, oh, you know, you need to go and sit on top of the mountain and meditate. It was within your life, what you're doing now, right? Let's find some, the, the, what's really driving you, what will really give you ultimate satisfaction. And once he did that, it gave me a focus that has helped me consistently. And now I know whether I'm on track or not, mm. right? By, by measuring what I'm doing against that core purpose, Right. And once I've, I put that into a phrase, which is to create the same greatest sustainable value, no excuses. Now, that means a lot to me. It doesn't mean a lot many to other people, but I, I can tie everything that's important to me into that sentence. And then when I look at what I'm doing, is it aligned with that? Am I in alignment with my core purpose? If I am, carry on. If I'm not, then change it. 
Mm. Yeah, and that's that's one thing that I particularly enjoyed about this book, the fact that it transcends just mere business advice, which you can't find elsewhere, but also couples it with this topic of being intentional, uncovering your core purpose, your values, your vision, and so on. And uh, I believe there's a section towards the end of the book where it says, you know, we start your each day um, focusing on what your purpose is and how you apply yourself towards um, working towards that purpose and achieving um, that vision. Uh, whereas I think, and you're absolutely right, so many business people, entrepreneurs and so on get caught up in the day-to-day grind and lose sight of that greater purpose and it becomes all about uh, staying alive, surviving, making money and so on. Um, But it's hard to play the long game if you're not driven by anything greater than, you know, the color green, I guess, if we're in the United States. Steve, I think think the, the interesting thing is if you ask most businessmen why they went to set up their own business, mm-hmm. right? it's making money is usually one of the answers. Mm-hmm. There are generally many others like independence, freedom, lifestyle, whatever it may be. And there's lots of reasons because, you know, it's, it's a, a challenge. Anyone is setting up their own business rather than taking a salary. It's risk every day. You're responsible for every moment. So there's more that drives you than just money. Um, but most of us get caught up in just trying to survive and therefore don't get the sense of fulfillment or satisfaction or or live the dream that we that drove us in the first place. And what we've found, Steve, it's very interesting as well, is that um, not only is focusing on that other dimension, that personal dimension, important for your personal well-being, but can actually help you run a better business. Mm-hmm. Because when you're feeling more balanced, more resilient, better able to cope, more fulfilled, you're, you're actually a better business person at the same time. You can make better decisions. Oh, yeah, of course. And that's, um, you know, far too often I hear people say things like, oh, I haven't got time to exercise or I haven't got time to um, take some time out to focus on myself. And usually when I hear that, it's, it tends to be people who perhaps need to take that time out the most or need to be intentional and focus on their own, you know, emotional well-being the most. And once they do that, then they're in a, space where they can make better decisions um, that will help their, uh, drive their business forward. Totally. And, and obviously, it's the extreme is, of course, you know, you're really not very good businessman when you die. Mm-hmm. So, you know, if you're not going to focus on your health, how on earth can you expect or anticipate right, being able to drive, run your business well? And yeah. what sort of example are you setting to the other people in the business and, and on and on like that? I mean, uh, it, it's core, cool, but we don't because we get caught up and we think we miss the 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 significance of the two elements. And it's the same thing. It's recognizing, you know, I recognize just I'm better at work when I'm happy at home, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm happier at home when I'm when things are happening at work. Yeah. Um, and they're deeply entwined because as a sole practitioner and running your own business, that's it comes with it. You live it every day, every moment. Um, it just mustn't overwhelm everything else. Yeah, definitely. And, and in my case, I'm a big uh, proponent of the three Fs, which is freedom, fulfillment, and finance. Um, you've got to have all three in alignment if you're going to be an entrepreneur and play the long game. Um, but Joel, uh, the book draws from a number of different uh, celebrated authors, such as Jim Collins, uh, Michael Gerber, Viktor Frankl, and Simon Sinek. And I like the way it simplifies a lot of business concepts, um, everything from, say, strategic planning. Uh, we mentioned systems earlier, uh, marketing, growth tactics, uh, how, do you, how do you build accountability into your business, even things like political maneuvering and um, measuring results. Um, and I guess it does that in a rather powerful way. And I guess, I mean, there are countless books on these topics out there already. So what else does the mindful entrepreneur bring to the table that other books don't? Is it the content, the delivery, or a bit of both? Um, look, I think that the delivery is definitely one aspect. Um, we've had feedback from you know literally dozens of business owners who have said they appreciate the, the rawness, the honesty mm. um, of the experience because they can relate to it. It's describing you know, how it's real experience, warts and all, and that makes it relatable. You know, we hear about, you know, incredible personalities like Steve Jobs, but it's hard to relate to them. Yeah. Um, but we can, I think everyone can relate to Howard Finger. And so telling the, the real story makes it feel real, relatable and applicable. So that's one aspect. Mm-hmm. And um, look, I think another aspect is the thing we've talked about, which is this 
this idea that that you, the state of your business and your state of mind are deeply intertwined. And the reality is you need to focus on both. So you've got books out there that focus on business. There are countless books on business. And there are many books on mindfulness and other yeah. psychological practices. There aren't too many that that focus on the integration between the two, a, what we call a holistic approach. Yeah. And Steve, I think what, what, was, what I think what the difference is, is number one, it, it's it's practical and it's real, so it's not just some consultant giving me some theory, right? So that's that's clearly tr- um, important. But I, I think this this integration of the two is that it's integrated within the process of running the business. So it's not like, as I said, go off and do some meditation separately. It's no within the context of my business. How do I apply that? focus and that that mindfulness to what I'm doing? How do I look at things in a way that will give me opportunity as, as opportunity rather than in the victim role within the context of running a business? And I the feedback we've got from people, which has been really, again, overwhelming, right, is people saying, I'm reading my own story here, right? I, I've suddenly seen insights into what, what went wrong and how I can um, take advantage of that um, which is which is a different way of looking at things today. Yeah, and uh, that triggers my memory to a conversation I had with a neuroscientist on the podcast uh, by the name of Mark Waldman, who said that if you want to be a mindful leader, it's not just about getting out of the room whenever you're, uh, say, struggling with some some issue and going off and meditating for 10 minutes and then coming back and then being an asshole. It's about being mindful in that moment when you're having a conversation with someone that may be unpleasant to respond um, rather than react and choose uh, well, rather be intentional about the, the situation and how you want to project yourself in that situation. And effectively, any external stimuli, you've got that split second where you can either you know, react in, in a way that doesn't really generate the results you desire. It might make you feel good in the moment, but ultimately uh, doesn't serve a greater purpose, or you can respond in a way that l- looks to find that outcome that you're after. And I think that's something that the book definitely uh, hits on. Um, throughout. It's not just, you know, I'll go off and, and meditate for 10 minutes. It's not just mindfulness practices. It is about, as Joel was saying earlier, being intentional uh, every day. And on being intentional, the book has an entire chapter dedicated to balance, uh, in which it provides tools uh, to help people map out things like values, uh, create measurable goals, and, ac- and action plans. And in your case, Howard, it was getting back to your karate fighting weight of 75 kilos. How, yeah. how did that go? I'm I'm at about 79 today. Um, I hit 80. I got down there, but I realised I didn't need to be there, Um, and I'm I'm comfortable just as long as I'm around 80. I'm running. I'm still running four days a week. Um, I haven't got into the into the dojo because I'm still a perfectionist in in that art, Uh um, and I need to spend more have more time to do that. But I felt that it wasn't it wasn't as necessary. I am working out with my daughter, um, which is a lot of fun. So yeah, I mean, uh, again, I I am a better, I'm much better in the office when I run in the morning than mm-hmm. when I haven't. Mm-hmm. Um, and if I, you know, I put in the book that I think we talked about how I, you don't see it yourself, but um, my staff used to talk to about me as as Hurricane Howard because <laughs> they'd say, you know, oh Howard's arriving, batten down the hatches, don't go near him. It's really difficult because he's always stressed out and angry. Yeah. Um, and I realized in retrospect just how inefficient and ineffective that is as a management style. Mm. Now, maybe Steve Jobs was able to do it, but since since then and now I'm I'm much more available, put it that way. I'm still focused, I'm still driven, I still want results, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm more available and, and less angry, I guess. And you're saying and that's partly because of the work you're doing in other aspects of your life. Sure, and and the systems are in place in the business. So I think one of the the, the lines that, that Joel said to me when he, you know was that he said if you're you know if you if you're running a business right and it can't, if well I always say if your business can't run without you then you don't have a business you have a job with overheads that's mm-hmm. the that's the idea yeah and that hit me deeply because the, my business could not run without me and when I realised I wasn't running a business I was just working a job with all the negatives of running a business. Yeah. And that when you shift that perspective and realize that, you know, what's the point? 
and so I think there's a lot of stuff that, that in the book, and I think the other the, what the book does is also is is recognise um, the limitations of us as as small business owners, mm -hmm. in that you know how many times have you been to um, a great um, conference or listened to a great speaker, come away with some great ideas. For me, I, they sat on the side of the desk uh, with every intention of implementing them. And then gradually they'd move further back towards the back of the desk and then fall in the dustbin. And I'd never implement. Mm -hmm. So I had great ideas where I think what Joel did um, and what the book does as well, I hope, is breaks it down into small digestible pieces that you can implement see the results and once you start to see the results then you've got to be really crazy not to continue the process when you see it working yeah and that's exactly right and today uh you know i think reading books amongst people who are say in the entrepreneurial space it's definitely uh, one of the most favorite one of our most favorite pastimes but i see so many people just reading one book after another sometimes reading four or five at a time and while it makes them feel good in the moment it often amounts to procrastination and they don't take any key insights out of those books don't create any um i suppose plans to implement uh anything they've taken out of that book any due dates any tasks nothing like that and it just becomes consume all this content forget 99 percent of it maybe if you're lucky implement one percent so definitely take uh things out of this book if you pick up the mindful entrepreneur and actually take those plans and 12-step programs and everything else that's in there and apply them take the time out um, put time in your calendar to take you away from all the supposedly urgent things in your day-to-day -day and start applying things because that's the only way you're going to get the results. Um, so, yes. Steve, uh, so what you can, what I also recommend is that um, well, there's a lot of um, of free resources we've made available in terms of templates and, and processes and systems that you can apply. And so if you go to the website, um, mindfulentrepreneur.co.co, mm -hmm. Right. Number one is there's lots of free stuff. There's some great videos and we've got a whole series we've built because in trying to to, to reach out to help other um, similar people, people in similar situations as myself. And you don't have to be in a desperate situation to get value out of this, of course, is that we put a whole series of videos up there, which, again, break down the processes into small chunks that you can listen to a video, apply it into your business. Right. And then make sure it works, then move on to the next one. And that's both. Aria has done a whole bunch of videos, so on the mindfulness space, mm -hmm. and so has, has, has Joel. And I highly recommend you go and have a look at those because, that, you know, again, each one is like under 10 minutes. So do one and get on with it. And then are you, if you can't fit 10 minutes into your life, then, you know. Yeah. Well, then you've got other problems. <laughs> um, yeah. That's great. We'll, we'll uh, share that in the show notes for, for the listeners. And um, I love the the Hurricane Howard nickname. Um, it. Uh, reminds me of uh, well Sir Alex Ferguson, who is synonymous with the hairdryer treatment he used to give players at Manchester United, and uh, David Beckham was an excuse from that. And uh, also reminds me of a little fable of the manager who would just scream at anyone who came reporting bad news. You know, he'd constantly shoot the messenger until he stopped hearing bad news. But it wasn't because the company was in a better position. Exactly. <laughs> um, and uh, one other thing I wanted to touch on. Uh, Howard, at one stage, you were ousted from your position as CEO in, um, I guess, what yeah. was a political power play, which saw you take the back seat for a little while. And during that time, uh, it's safe to say your, your lifestyle was a little bit more relaxed. You got to spend a bit more time with the family. But yeah. slowly but surely, the phone started ringing more and more frequently and people started seeking your advice um, until it became apparent that you had to come back on board to help, to help save the company. So, I mean, what was going through your head when you were at first ousted as the CEO? And second, after settling into that relaxed lifestyle, um, you know, being thrown back into battle. So, um, it was an ambush. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think it was, I don't know how unusual it was, but, you know, I had um, a sales director, a managing director um, in the UK who headed up the sales. Um, and basically, I'd given up ownership and run the business in any event to him. Mm, um, yeah. And he was, he was key. I saw him as key in that role, in the sales role. And I had a couple of other people, my, uh, my COO, um, who was running the back office. Um, and so when they came and said to me, they thought that I was the problem, why the business wasn't succeeding, um, you know, you'd think you'd say, oh, well, get rid of them. Well, you can't because who's going to run the business? Mm. Um, 
And so really I was left with no no choice but to pull back unless I wanted to shut the business down, which I wasn't going to do at the time because it was the only income I had. Um, now, again, there's, there's nothing much worse than that sort of um, betrayal, I guess. Um, and so the pain that comes with that and the, the sense of your own internal failure. Um, so, no, not a very good place. Um, and so I came back to Australia and, yeah, I had more time. Um, and, but I knew I hadn't achieved what I wanted to achieve. So there was a constant sense of, of, um, a nagging question in my mind as to, you know, why, why was I not good enough? Why hadn't I done it that I hadn't succeeded? Um, um, but it didn't take very long to recognize that, that, um, the guy who was in London wasn't, was actually trying to, to destroy the business himself, actually. So you have to get into the story of the book, uh, the story of my life. But um, it became clear that he wasn't going to turn the business around. And in fact, things were getting worse. So at which point, literally, I had the choice. Um, do I dig deep and go back into the battle? And it's this this hero's journey, this this um, this whole concept of, of you know, you have your, 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 your lost you, 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 uh, the whole Star Wars or, or Karate Kid, that's what the whole story seemed to seem like to us. It was the, the epic hero journey where you're lost, you get beaten up, the guru comes and helps you out and you refuse it and then you get beaten up again and so you go into training, right? And then you, you go into training, you come back and you go into the big battle. And it felt like that to me, um, that I was going back into the battle to try and save the business um, and, and save what I built. And so, Without the support, I think, of, of Joel, uh, certainly my wife, Andrea, um, and Joel and, and Aria, giving me um, focus and made me, having me see what I needed to do to do right, to put it right, um, I'm not sure I'd have done it. But um, as it was, it was um, hugely challenging, but exciting as well, because I suddenly realized I had the opportunity to try and put it right. Mm. Um, I'd spent 10 years struggling and bumbling along, right, surviving, and now I, I had a sense of how to fix it. That was was empowering. Yeah, and I guess it came back to that core purpose of yours that you defined earlier, and that's a big part of the reason why you got why why you decided to get back into battle. And it sounds like the business is in a much better place today. Yeah, we're doing. I'd like to say we're doing very well. It's great. We're achieving our growth rates, thirty mm percent -hmm. um, growth a year, and um, breaking into new markets. Now, now we've achieved. Um, you know, pretty much penetration and saturation in the core, core legal market, very much what was planned, mm. right? Um, with some sort of adaption, you always have to be flexible and, and be looking at the market. But, um, yeah, and I'm playing some golf and I'm traveling. And now my wife travels with me, which, as I said, is a lot more fun. Mm -hmm. um, and, yeah, thank God it's working. Fantastic. Well, I'm glad glad to hear after partaking. I feel like I, I partook in your journey just by reading the book. So it's glad to hear things are working and not just working for the business, but also uh, working at home and, you know, you're emotionally working and everything else. That's, that's just fantastic to hear. And uh, people can find out more about the book, as you said, at mindfulentrepreneur.co. Um, cool. But before we wrap up, gentlemen, we've got a little ritual here at Future Squared, where we have a three-question lightning round, and I'm going to have to throw you both into battle. Are you ready to rock and roll? Ready. Sure. <laughs> okay. Question number one, and I'll direct this one at Joel. I know you're uh, running your own coaching business at the moment called The Change Coach, which we'll talk about in a second. But if you had to work for another organization at any point of the company life cycle, who would it be and why? Wow. Come and work for me, of course. <laughs> of course. <laughs> Um, gee, I, I'm so enjoying running my own business uh -huh. that I'm not sure I want to work for anyone else. Yeah, um, that's fair. But if I could, if I could, I'd choose uh, an interesting, innovative organization like seek.com.au. There's a lot of really interesting, innovative practices that they're engaged in. Mm -hmm. And it's not just the fact that there's a slide which takes you from level one to, to level two <laughs> and slide down. Um, or the fact that you can get, uh, you know, ice creams and icy poles at the front entrance when you walk in. Um, but they're very much focused on innovation. Um, and so I'd, I'd probably choose them. Mate, you, you had me at slide. Uh, <laughs> anyway, um, question number two for you, Howard, is if you could ask anyone a question, dead or alive, who would it be and what would you ask? Oh, Even tougher. Anyone dead or alive, what would I ask? Um, 
Uh, that's a really hard one. Um, okay, how long have I got? I can, I can always edit out the uh, time it takes you to think about it. <laughs> uh, then give, me, give me a moment then. Who would I ask? Any, any person, any question. Mm -hmm. Dead or alive. Dead or alive. Probably go back and, I mean, uh, I, you know, I can have two answers. One is I go and say to, um, I'd say to Eve, why did you eat that apple? Um, but the other question, the other one would be, um, there's an inspiration for me. Anybody alive? My God. Um, Who did you idolize as a kid? Yeah, that's, what I'm, that's what, exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> um, so uh, I would, I would probably ask. Um, yeah, I, I would probably ask the Beatles why they broke up. <laughs> Yeah, it's not yeah. deep and meaningful, but no, it's. I mean, I they thought, were the, the biggest band asked, in the world. Asked that guy who shot John Lennon, was it really necessary? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's that's a great one. Um, usually, we have people say they, you know, Abraham Lincoln, or they'll go back and yeah. talk to Steve Jobs and stuff like that. But to ask, and as someone who assassinated uh, John Lennon, that's an interesting one. Definitely worthwhile understanding what was going through his head and whether it was worth it i carried that for a long time mm. that took me for a long time sorry Fantastic. all Not good really um, and the lucky last question is for you joel um we've covered a few practices in this episode around uh you know mindfulness just being intentional with your day-to-day -day, perhaps working out do you have any rituals or routines to help you stay on top of your game um absolutely um one thing i do is carve out some time and space mm -hmm. for thinking about my my life and my business. Mm. Um, in other words, am I aligned with my own core purpose? And I try to do that li literally every morning. Um, and I carve out some time once a week. Um, in the book, we talk about this idea of a digital Sabbath where you literally um, – close off from some tech, from all the technology that, you know, bugs us and annoys us and constantly <laughs> harasses us and asks for our time and enables me to focus on my family, myself, and that ultimately aims, enables me to be a better business person and a better person in general. Yeah, yeah. We've got a, a running theme here. I spoke with uh, Brad Feld, the co-founder of Techstars, who've incub who have incubated something like 1,000 startups and raised $3 billion the other day, and he also... Uh, calls it a digital Sabbath every Friday. He just takes out the whole day. No phones, no tablets, no anything. Spends time with the family, spends time outdoors. And he just says, you know, it's so critical to have that mental reset. Um, and I myself find it that even if I spend two or three hours away from my phone, just emotionally feel so much better. I think also, Steve, when you do that around your family, you um, – are clearly making a statement to them mm -hmm. that they are more important yeah. at that time. And that is so significant. Definitely. I've, I've actually gotten to the point now where if I visit family, whether it's mom or, or, or my sister and her kids, I'll leave the phone in the car because that way I've got no distraction. I'll get out there for a couple of hours and we'll just have something called a conversation, which uh, people uh, seem to be shying away from these days. But it's been an absolute pleasure having a conversation with you gentlemen. Um, People can obviously get the book on Amazon. They can find it at places where all good books are sold. They can head over to mindfulentrepreneur.co to find out more about the book, but also access those resources you spoke of earlier. And Joel, where can people find out more about your coaching business, The Change Coach, and connect with you? So that they can find out more about me through mindfulentrepreneur.co, but yes, they can also go to my, my other coaching website, which is The Change Coach. Dot co. Fantastic. And any parting words of wisdom for our listeners? I think take ownership, be responsible, right? You can do it. It's not magic. It's just a process. McDonald's makes very average hamburgers, mm -hmm. but the key is that they make the same average hamburgers perfect every single time. And, the, and therefore, everybody knows exactly what they're going to get. And that's only down to systems and having processes in place and you can be just as successful. And, and I think just to, just to add to that, it's just the recognition that 
your your business is important and you need to be deliberate and intentional about your business and you need to be deliberate and intentional about every other aspect of your life because the two are intertwined. Beautiful. I couldn't have said it any better. Thanks again for your time today, gentlemen, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks Thanks very much. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Hey guys, it's Steve again. If you're picking up what we're putting down, we'd love it if you took just a minute of your time to like, share, or subscribe to Future Squared on iTunes, SoundCloud, or Stitcher. It would mean a hell of a lot to the team here who work effortlessly to bring you thought leaders and experts on topics of corporate innovation, entrepreneurship, and self-improvement on a weekly basis. As always, you can find more resources on innovation, um, including blogs, books, podcasts, videos, webinars, and tools at www.collectivecamp.us. If you'd like to connect with me on Twitter, you can do so at Steve Glaveski. That's G-L-A-V-E-S-K-I. Until next time, keep innovating. Future Squared out.